Good evening, everyone. I'm Father Thomas Massaro, Associate Professor of Moral Theology at Weston Jesuit School of Theology here in Cambridge. Welcome to Cambridge Forum with Father Robert Drynan discussing the topic God and Caesar, Religious Freedom and International Law. Can God and Caesar coexist in peace? Asks Father Robert Drynan in his latest book, Can God and Caesar Coexist? Balancing Religious Freedom and International Law. Noting that the United Nations has never adopted a legally binding covenant guaranteeing freedom of religion, Drynan explores questions of feminism, homosexuality, religious conversion, and other contentious issues of belief in the modern multicultural world. Should religious rights trump other political and human rights? What role can international organizations play in fostering freedom of conscience and religion? Like myself, Father Drynan is both a Jesuit priest and an academic. He is currently professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. A former dean of Boston College Law School, he is the author of 11 previous books, including The Mobilization of Shame, A Worldview of Human Rights. Father Drynan was a United States congressman from Massachusetts for five terms and has served on many publicly and privately sponsored international human rights missions. He is the recipient of the 2003 Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute of Freedom Medal, uh, Freedom of Worship Medal. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Father Robert Drynan. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you for all, all for coming. I uh, always love to speak at, <clears throat> in a Unitarian presence. I, I know that you're not officially or formally as associated, but some of my best friends and most of my best constituents were, were, friends, were, were nice people, friends, Quakers, <laughs> Unitarians. And that uh, regularly, uh, some years ago, I used to lecture at the Crane Theological Seminary at Tufts. As you know, Tufts grew up Unitarian. They came away from Cambridge from those dreadful theists. And that I, I miss that uh, wonderful setting. Well, I, uh, like you, I all, always love to come to Harvard Square and find out the latest problems of the president of Harvard, little things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, love particularly to come and talk about uh, theology and God. You're not going to get any easy answers tonight, I'm sorry to say. And the, my editor at Yale University Press said, this book is completely unique. There's no book like this in the English language. And I, I don't know whether that's good or bad, but that is a very, very profound problem, and I really can't tell you how grateful I am for your coming. Um, uh, selling this book uh, over the country Yale and other nice people set up things, and it's fascinating to find out the vibrations. I was on uh, a conference, or, or rather a committee the other day, at the National Press Club in Washington, and there were two evangelical divines with me. And I love to be very, very tolerant and all, but these people were a little frightening. And all they kept saying is, we want to be in the public square, like dictating the public morality. They won't say that. Well, uh, is there any <clears throat> solution through the years or over the centuries for this problem? Every time I, I think of it, it all goes back in our times to the Holocaust. I was appointed by President Carter to be on the original memorial that created the Holocaust Memorial. And I lived through it as never before. And the Jewish community in America and around the world uh, are owed tremendous admiration and gratitude. They raised all of the money from the Jewish community. And if you haven't seen the memorial to the Holocaust, you have to go to Washington and, and spend two hours. And you come out and say, how in the name of God could humanity have ever done this? Well, after World War II, we, uh, the United Nations was very sensitive to this. And I want to tell you some of the things that happened then, and uh, the Vatican II, that changed everything. And more importantly, we come down to today, 
and what are we going to do about the 48 Islamic countries? I hope that you have been in Israel to the memorial to the Holocaust. You come out of there limp after two or three uh, hours, and I recall particularly the hall, an immense hall, where all of people named Rosenthal are remembered. There was a congressman, Ben Rosenthal, who was a good friend, and I just stared and stared at those names, and how in the name of anybody uh, can we allow this ever to happen again? Well, the United Nations, as I said, began, and in the UN document and also in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the first time in human history, the religious freedom is protected and guaranteed, as well as freedom of conscience. Just amazing, the freedom of conscience, that we can't bend the conscience or defy the conscience of anybody uh, with a few qualifications. It has to be somewhat reasonable. Well, now at the United Nations, we have six monitoring committees, and they supervise and warn people in the various countries about political rights, economic rights, the rights of women, race, children, and torture. That is a body of information that is being gathered, but we have no monitoring group for religious freedom. Way back when these were being adopted, lots of people said, well, let's have a covenant on religious freedom. But there was never really any world consensus on that. And as a result, the world community settled in 1981 for a mere declaration on religious freedom. You don't have to ratify it at the state level. That document is in my book. And it's a very powerful document, and it shows for the first time in the history of the world that world law, international law, forbids any uh, community discriminating on the basis of, of race. Well, is there some possibility that after these 25 years we could transfer, transform, elevate the, the declaration into a covenant? Well, my book recommends that, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen right away. What are we thinking about? Well, I'm afraid that this is so hot to handle and that we have new information now about the 48 Islamic countries. And as I'm going to say later, China has got a pretty dim record. What can we do? There was a little baby step taken some five years ago. The evangelicals in this country had the Congress ratify or uh, pass a bill and uh, Clinton signed it reluctantly, that gives a voice to the evangelicals in the State Department. They monitor religious freedom around the world. Has that done any good? The State Department is not thrilled about it, but at least on a regular basis we get information now about the denial of religious freedom all around the world. We had never had that information put together that way. Well, is this just a dream that uh, it's not going to happen? Well, I come to my second point. It has happened in Vatican II. You know all about this. We all lived through those exciting years, 62 to 65. And once again, for the first time in human history, the Catholic Church prayer forbade uh, any violation of the religious freedom of others. And it said very expressly that there shall be no shadow of, con of uh, coercion. And it traced the terrible history of uh, religious groups, Catholic and Protestant through the centuries, and said, we abhor that. We respect the liberty of conscience of other people, and we're never going to impose our belief on them again. Well, the Catholic Church has tried to live up to that, and that uh, I think that we've made great progress, and everywhere, everywhere in the world, uh, that magnificent document is cited. And Americans had a good deal to do with that, especially the late Father John Courtney Murray. Well, all of this was kind of quiescent until the Communists collapsed in 1991. The world was waiting for something to happen, and I was the delegate of the American Bar Association at a World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna in 1993. And the Clinton people did fantastic, and they have a document that came forth in, 19, in, in 1993. It's just splendid, very, very strong on religious freedom. And after that, we looked around the world, and the Communists are gone f from Europe and, and Russia and the Eastern Europe wants to reclaim its, uh, its religious properties and its tradition of religious freedom. And now, ten years later, as my book suggests, there's more profound interest in the expansion of religious freedom than any time, certainly any time since uh, World War II. Well, what are the problems? 
I don't mean to say that the Islamic nations uh, present more problems than the others. We don't know much about those 48 states. We know that every fifth human being is a Muslim, 1.3 billion. We know how difficult they can be. But I'm trying to learn more and more about the various separate facilities or attitudes or traditions in all of these Muslim countries. Is it possible that they would come to some understanding of Western culture? They're all members of the United Nations, and many of them, virtually all of them, have signed up with the economic and the political rights, the covenant, and that means that they guarantee that they will put that into their law. They now have uh, some semblance of a consortium on human rights among the Muslim nations, but is it our fault that we know so little about them? I must say that I'm embarrassed that I know so little about the Muslim countries. And I traveled some time ago to Malaysia and Indonesia, and they know too little about us. Is there some way by which we could have a, a meeting of the nations and a meeting of the theologians? Uh, the late Pope tried to do something like that, and as you know, he was fantastic on the, uh, the Jewish community, and that unlike any of his predecessors, he recognized Israel as a nation and gave a diplomatic status. He also lamented and re repeated to the world many times the terrible things that the Christians, the Catholics did to the Jews. So now we have a whole new world. And the Pope himself has apologized for the Crusades, the Inquisition, the persecution of the Jews. And it's a new tabula rasa. We're beginning anew. Almost as if this is the beginning of humanity. And it is that we have suffered so long. You may say, well, this is starry-eyed because the Catholics and the Protestants are still fighting them, fighting each other in Northern uh, Ireland, and we are all still quivering with the terrible things that happened in the Balkans. And we look to Rwanda and the international tribunals at The Hague, and also for Rwanda, and we say, well, is it possible that we would get a situation where there's more religious toleration? Well, that's the essence of my book. And I'm not over-optimistic. All I can say is that this is an entirely new era. And that brings me to my third and most important point. Uh, where do we start? Assuming now that there's some momentum in America and in the United Nations, what are we going to do about China? We have opened our doors to China. We used to require the Senate or the House every year to renew the most favored nation status, and now they have that permanently. That means they can export to us and import from us any goods uh, with no tariffs or quotas. Well, that's an immense uh, benefit to them, obviously. Well, what about opening up to uh, forces from outside, like religious forces? The State Department, State Department last year asked me to spend an afternoon with 12 important people from China. And they wanted, or the State Department wanted them to talk about religious freedom. And it was a hard sell. These 12 people were communists. They had been in the government. And human rights is a Western construct. Don't tell us about that. And they could see that I was a Catholic priest, and we brought that up. Hard line. That, you know, that we don't want any Christians. That's a foreign element that's never been in China in all our centuries. Could we say that every nation like China has some, uh, some ambition, some obligation to let in a rational number of missionaries? The Mormons are intensely interested in this, and I've dialogued with them lately. As you know, they have missionaries in some 80 or more nations. They have none in all of the 48 Islamic countries. And they say they are impelled by their divine command to uh, proselytize, and they can't get into China at all. Are they saying that there's an internationally recognized right for people with these convictions to go to another nation? Should we think about that? We allow them to come here, theoretically. We're not too nice to them, probably. But that at least we say that they, in conscience, are driven to say that someone has to believe in the, the Book of Mormon. I know some Mormons. There's 33 Mormon students at Georgetown uh, Law Center, and they come together every week to pray. Very admirable people. Uh, you can look at their theology and you say, well, could I believe that? But there are people like that all around the world. 
Sometimes we look upon them as uh, a bit extremist, the Jehovah Witnesses and, uh, and the Scientologists, but we can't stand in judgment at any level on the propriety or truth of, of all those people. We should be glad that they feel called by God and that people like that through the centuries have done wonders for humanity, elevated the whole thing. Well, let's move to India, one-fifth of humanity, more or less. And uh, they used to allow Christians in. They let Mother Teresa in. But that more and more hard line that we don't want these foreign people coming in. The uh, Jesuits have done very well in India. There's more Jesuits in India now than in the United States. But they're, they're natives, and they're, they're people who believe this, a tiny uh, minority. Is there something for the international community to argue? Certainly it is. There's foreign, there's forums everywhere. And that uh, they recognize that by international law, everybody has a right to conscience and a right to proselytize within certain realms. Well, sometimes people say, well, we, we don't want to encourage the people who would uh, kill the widow on the pyre, as some places in India apparently they still do. Well, we recognize all of that. And in the Declaration on Religious Freedom, it spells out exactly what religious freedom is. And that for centuries, some religions have said, oh, they're all fanatics and we're going to kill them. And we don't want them here at all. And my church has been more guilty of that possibly than any other religion. And now we have learned from God that all of that was a mistake and that we had no right to do the Inquisition or, or the Crusades or the persecution of the Jews. And now we come to a new day, that we have to be respectful of these other traditions. What is going to happen to the Muslim countries? Everyone is different, even though we think they're all Muslim countries. Everyone has a different tradition. And the thing we don't face up to very often is the hatred and the animosity that they have for the Christian countries that proselytize. I spoke some time ago to a man in Malaysia who was Muslim, and that he was very restrained. But he said that you people have no idea how the Muslim community here resents what the colonial powers do. You came, and in his judgment, you changed our maras, you corrupted us, and you, you wiped away or tried to wipe away our basic culture, and we want to get that back. And there were echoes of that, too, in Indonesia. And they said that the Dutch did terrible things. Well, all over the Muslim world, you have the remnants of colonialism. Are they supposed to jump up and down and say that, well, we'll invite you here uh, because of religious freedom? Well, they're divided about the interpretation of the Koran. We know some of the awful things that they do in some Muslim countries such as female genital mutilation, which hopefully is on the way out. And all around the world now, we have thousands of non-governmental agencies devoted to human rights. This is a phenomenon that really hit me in Vienna in 1993. Literally, two or 3,000 NGOs devoted to various things, like women or the disabled or refugees. It was a revelation of the throbbing uh, issues of grace that people want for humanity. And everybody left there saying, well, this is a whole new philosophy of the world, if you will. And I was proud for once of the UN, the U.S. government that orchestrated this whole thing. Well, there's a beautiful manifesto at the end of uh, Vienna. I have that as an appendix to my previous book, and all of us should read it. Is it hard to, to dialogue with Muslims? Yes and that we have a group in Washington, and it, it meets, and then it doesn't meet. And the questions are imponderable. And obviously, one of the most difficult questions is homosexuality. And these people look at the United States and say, you are going to allow these people like to exist? Well, you try to talk to them, but that's worlds apart. For them, this is just forbidden. Well, uh, there are other difficult countries around the world and that I was a monitor of the election in Ukraine uh, in Christmas week. And this is 48 million people who are Christians, more or less, and they've broken off from Russia and they're delighted to, to be away. 
and they have to make some fundamental decisions about what to do about religion. They have the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox and the Roman Catholics and a tiny little community of surviving Jews. Well, the new president is quite a person, and he wants to follow international law. So they have two or three scholars at the law school there figuring out what is the best way pursuant to international law to govern the religious communities in Ukraine. And I talked with them, but there's no, like, easy answer. All we have to do is keep remembering the terrible things that we did. That's why we should remind ourselves of the Holocaust it, it, all, all of the time. Never, never forget. And that's what Elie Wiesel says, the ultimate sin, the worst sin, is to forget. How could we have done these things? Well, is there some nice, easy solution I, w I wish that there were, but let me suggest three things that you should do, and then I want your questions and comments. First of all, you should study. You should understand this. Even after writing this whole book, I feel that I'm kind of ignorant about whole areas. And uh, we should seek to understand the fact that the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and the Muslim religion, are fundamentally the same in many ways. God has intervened in history. He has revealed himself to Abraham and to Christ and to uh, Mohammed. Well, it's beautiful if you look at it that way. Well, why are we fighting each other or have through the centuries? Well, let's, let's talk about that. And the essence of all these religions is love. Is there some way by which we can be at peace with China and India and all of those uh, former co colonial powers who don't have respect really for the West. Uh, we've been trying, and we have at the United Nations, we have all of these committees. We shouldn't get too discouraged because since 1945, the world has achieved fantastic things that had never been accomplished before, such as the formation of the UNHCR for refugees. There's now 18 million refugees that are being cared for, at least more than they were before World War II. We also established the World Health Organization. They've done fantastic things like the total elimination of polio. We have UNICEF for children, and they have given inoculations to millions of children in the third world who otherwise would not have obtained it. And we have other agencies like the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees and for Human Rights. And yet we look back and say, how could we survive in a world like this? You have one-fifth of humanity, a billion people who are living in conditions unworthy of anybody in the human family. They don't get adequate food. And if you want to remember one simple fact of this lovely meeting tonight, remember that 31,000 children die today and every day. I mean, millions of children. It's easy to say, well, that has always happened in the history of the world. But we committed ourselves at the UN to stop that. And we created UNICEF and other agencies and that that should be terminated. I'm sorry to say that our country, the United States, ranks 21 out of 21 donor nations. So we haven't fulfilled all of our commitment. Are we fulfilling our commitments through religious freedom to guarantee that everywhere or to scold or do something about those nations that really persecute religions? Well, we like to think that we're on top of this, but I've talked with people at every level and at the highest levels of the State Department, they'd have to say, well, we have not really even tried to do that. We're afraid. Well, our record is all right, more or less. We have some things still to decide. But in this Declaration of Human Freedom, one of the more difficult ones is what does international law and its guarantee of religious freedom, what does that say about church-related, uh, Muslim-related schools around the world? The United States is the only democracy in the world that denies substantial help to schools, collegiate, uh, co uh, religious schools of less than uh, collegiate rank. In every other democracy, like England and France, they say if parents want their children to have an education with this religious orientation, that's their right. And in England now, recently, they finally admitted that the Muslim schools have a right to subsidies, 90% of maintenance and 75% of re replacement costs. This is going to be a very difficult problem for Europe, assuming that Turkey eventually gets into the European Union. 
And there's enormous resistance. It's a large country, 40 million. It'll be the first non-Christian group or first uh, non-European. And I assume it's going to happen and there'll be members of the EU. Let me tell you about a very difficult case that happened recently in Turkey. As you know, Turkey is a very secular country. They felt victimized by the uh, Muslims for a long time. So around 1920 or 30, they secularized the country. Five years ago, there was a woman who wore the Turkish, or the Muslim veil. She felt required to do that. She was in medical school in Istanbul, and they said, you can't wear that uh, headdress. So she had to go off to Vienna to finish her medical studies, and the whole world was rooting for her, saying, well, that's, that's outrageous. You have that right. But unfortunately, in my judgment, the European Court of Human Rights recently said Turkey has the right to ban this manifestation of religion. Well, those are some of the big questions that have to be resolved. You may say, well, it's just too much. Just let all those people live where they are. Well, we can't do that. In the nature of international law, every human being has a right to all the guarantees that are now in international law. And religious freedom is certainly one of them. In fact, one of the more prominent ones. Well, how are we going to resolve it? Well, that's the problem for the international community. Have we been sweeping it under the carpet? Pretty much. That we don't have a covenant? Is this going to happen? Will this develop? I don't know what's going to happen. And no one around the world knows. Could we have another war between the in the West and uh, Muslim countries, we look back at the Balkans and say, that happened on our watch? Those people killing each other because they were Muslims or not Muslims? Well, my dear friends, I'm not giving you something that's nice and simple tonight. First, to repeat, you have to be informed. Where can you get information? It's, it's out there. Any book, any library, any database will tell you more than one sitting that you want to know uh, about this big problem. Should we get angry at the Chinese and say, you can't tell a couple after they've had the first family, first child, that they have to abort the second and third child? There are four couples now in the United States pleading for asylum status here because if they go back to China, they will be required to abort their second child. I don't know whether they should be given. Under federal law, a thousand people like that can be taken in every year. The pro-life people in the Congress got that through. That's one of the tough, tough problems. And most people say, well, that's too hard. I mean, we, we can't solve that problem. Well, there's other things, too, that are seemingly less outrageous in some countries where churches can hardly exist. Russia has accommodated the, the churches after the fall of communism a little bit. But they're not returning the property that was seized from the Jesuits and many other people. We have all of these problems. And the feeling in this country, uh, at least the implicit, implicit feeling, is that uh, we, we, we got a good deal here and that well, let's not, and that we have only 4% of humanity consuming 40% of the resources of the world in America and we have to do more on this. Well, the first point is be informed and the second is that we should pray. People may say, well, I don't pray. I'm a non-believer. But we're all brothers and sisters. And we in the United States, this mighty nation, guaranteed religious freedom in the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration, in five major international covenants. The right of conscience is there, even down to the covenant on, on children. So we say, well, we have moral and legal obligations to the human family. And just being pragmatic, if we had people guaranteed their religious freedom, and if we could say to nations, you can't penalize people because of their conscience, theoretically that would be a step forward that we're not going to have a war over religion anymore. That's the hideous thing, isn't it? We've had wars over religion, and that uh, it happened. And the wars by the communist nation, to some extent, were over religion. And we like to say, well, we never participated in that. We have, if we have the 16 words of the First Amendment. That may be. But if we want peace in the world, we can't do it by having more militaries thinking more nukes. That's not going to work. We have to have an understanding with people. Do they think that the United States would wage war against them because of their religion? 
Lots of people in Iraq certainly think that. Why did they descend upon us without, uh, international, without international supervision or authority? Well, that second point, how can you pray to understand? That's what religion and non-religion is all about. Even the philosophers will say, you have to be calm, you have to be think, thinking, and you have to inquire of these other people. Well, being informed is in and of itself a prayer, that you care about these people. And it's all involved, of course, in the status of women, especially in the 48 Islamic countries. That intertwines with it. And there's a professor at Georgetown Law School who is writing a book uh, to the effect that bigamy and polygamy are a basic violation of the rights of women. And that if the Quran allows it, and that's in doubt, that if, if they allow that, that's, that's not merely against religion, but it's against the rights of women. And also, she says, it's against the rights of children, because they have only half or one-third of the income of their natural father. Well, you may say that these are cosmic problems, and that I'd prefer to fight against the nomination of John Bolton. Please do. I mean, that's something very concrete. I don't think that we have the votes, but at least we, we make a protest. And that here's the man who wants to wreck the United Nations is not going to be the ambassador. You may say there's too many things that come up every day that I can understand, and why should I spend some energy on all of these incomprehensible things? Well, the future of the world may depend upon it. Could we have another holy war by Muslims against us or by some people in the West who say that we want to preserve Western civilization? That's what some of these evangelicals are saying, and they want to do it by guns if necessary. Well, you may say once again, this is too much. Let me, let me be. Well, I've come here to put you on a guilt trip. And that the guilt is that you have to be informed and you have to pray and you have to act. Well, how can I act? Well, you're all highly accomplished people. You've done lots of good things in your lifetime. Many of you elected me. That's a good deed. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, you can do other things. And that you may say, well, I, I, I need a challenge, but it has to be uh, understandable. And this is not. Well, you read more, as I did preparing this book, and you'll say that this is probably the number one problem in the world. That we or others persecute people, prosecute people, because they are religious or not religious. And it's still down to that. Does the United Nations do what it can well, Kofi Annan is very interested in developing the Declaration on Religious Freedom into a covenant. But he has lots of other problems. But the entire international community of scholars is deeply interested in transforming, lifting up the right to religious freedom so that it is somehow enforceable around the world. Well, before your, your comments and your questions, let me conclude by saying that the third thing that you have to do, you have to study... You have to act, uh, and you have, and you pray, and you have to act on, on love. You may say, well, all of this is mushy love, but that's what it's all about. From Moses to the present day, the essence of the Abrahamic religion is that we have to love each other. You remember the story of the Samaritan who spends his own resources for this stranger? And we all know the Beatitudes, blessed are those who don't persecute. And, and that's the essence of Judaism and Christianity and the Muslim religion. The Muslim religion has fantastic devotion to the poor and to the disadvantaged. They have hospitals and orphanages and all. We don't always get that coming out to us. We tend to think, well, they're kind of fanatics. Uh, and that we, we well, that's uh, one more mistake that we're making. And that if you go and talk with the delegations from remote uh, uh, Islamic countries, you'll see that they've been educated at Oxford or Harvard and that they are not going to sell out to the West. They're profoundly religious. I mean, they say their prayers five times a day. Wow. I mean, that, that, that's in their bones. Well, <clears throat> are they going to give us a lot of grief by warfare? I don't know. But it is just irrational for us not to have community and dialogue with all of these people, 1.2 billion. The image that they have of us, I'm certain, is very, very negative. Let me close by saying 
the best thing, uh, the most important thing is that you have to exercise love. Let me quote uh, the first letter of John. Quote, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Thank you very much. You are joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Father Robert Drinan discussing his latest book, Can God and Caesar Coexist? Religious Freedom and International Law. Allow me to pose the first question to Father Drinan. It seems that some nations are simply antagonistic towards either all religion, like China, or all religions besides their established one, like Islamic nations. You have a chapter on each in your book. What are the prospects that having an international covenant and a tribunal would make a real difference in how people in such nations actually fare if they are religious minorities? In other words, how can international law intervene to stop intolerance? Cannot these nations simply hide behind the cloak of self-determination and justify their actions by claims of national sovereignty? Well, uh, there are three instances that would suggest that an international ban on religious persecution would work. We have a covenant on, uh, on the rights of women now, and it's rather recently, and there's a world tribunal that adjudicates all of this, their rulings come out, and in many cases around the world, nations, seeing the example of a, of a, a bad nation, have elevated it. And even more dramatically, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is very new. Every nation except the United States has ratified it. God help us. And that they have recordings, and the world looks at the rulings. Good things have happened. For example, Brazil now have, have the rights of children in their new constitution. And El Salvador always used to categorize a child as born under wedlock. That's forbidden now. That's dropped because of this world thing. Well, could a world tribunal on religious freedom, could that elevate the standards of the world? That's the theory. That's what law is all about, that we put standards and that we have the mobilization of shame of other nations. It's not going to be a perfect solution, but if the countries, the uh, Christian countries, if they submit to this and they get criticized, it could have a wonderful impact. I think everybody in the world is ashamed at religious persecution. It's something indefensible. And from the Christian point of view, we say definitely that a person who believes has a grace from God and that the person who does not believe should not be scolded or persecuted because God, for mysterious reasons, has not given him. So, uh, Father, you raised the good question. All I can say is that law is a very feeble instrument, but sometimes it does work. You are listening to Father Robert Drinan discussing the topic, God and Caesar, Religious Freedom and International Law. Let's now take some questions from the audience. What's your view and the view of the international community on what France is doing by uh, prohibiting headscarves and yarmulkes uh, in their schools? Well, I, w I would hope that uh, that would be forbidden by international law. But the European Court of Human Rights, as I mentioned, said that uh, Turkey has the right to do that. And somehow France has this obsession that they don't want, they don't like the five million Muslims who have come in. And they admit that this is probably wrong and that it's a different culture. And in Germany, they have the same thing. Sixty percent of all the children now in the public schools of Frankfurt, Germany, are Muslim. And they're slow to learn the language. They have their own mosques and so on. It's a, it's a cultural uh, front. So that the symptom of the headdress is just a small. We have to teach them tolerance and lots of things that are involved. Some people probably think that these Turks are taking away their job. They certainly think that in, in Germany. And that, uh, all I can say, ma'am, it's a good question, is that we have to somehow say to the world that we uh, have tolerance and respect for our Muslim population. We, we over, overstate that, and that we're pretty bad still on the blacks and all. 
But all I can say is it goes back to the Islamic religion, or rather to the Abrahamic religion, that we love each other. I mean, that's the essence of it. We're bad religious people. We don't do that. Jews are Christians and Muslims. And that's the test in all of those religions. And that we should say we not merely tolerate these people, but we should allow them to develop their own sense of religious freedom. Yes. Yeah. I, I certainly agree with all that you've said with regard to what we should be doing with regard to the rest of the world and uh, do whatever we can to enhance and establish freedom of conscience and religion. But I was wondering if you might address yourself to the other side of that coin, which is the situation like in our country where a small, well-organized religious minority uh, essentially wants to change civil laws so that they apply to everything you know, everybody in addition to themselves. I mean, I have, may have my own religion or I may not have a religion at all or I may have a totally different point of view right. of when life but, begins, but who et are cetera. these people in America? These are the Falwells of this world, huh? Well, yeah, the, the, the really, the, the fundamentalists, yeah. No, and the ones who, who basically uh, picket hospices because they don't think hospice is a good idea, well, things uh, like that. the questions are getting too hard. Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, now, this, it's a very good point, and we have seen that. And I uh, debated the other day at the National Press Club with two evangelicals, very uh, nice men. But they think that somehow it should be a theocratic government. They never say that. But, oh, we want to be in control, and God wants us to be in control to ev evangelize. Well, the United States has resisted that pretty well. Now, people think that we should have more about God in the schools and all. But uh, are we the model for the world now yes and no and that at least we should explore all the differences now should we try to export that uh, calm between church and state to other nations yeah it's in the it's in the document of 1981 the UN document of tolerance and uh, allowing them encouraging them to do these things and that at a moment stop that we you're not going to influence a country and lots of people think that in the last election the evangelicals went too far. They organized votes for Republicans along the lines of the the pastor, and I think that may have stepped over the line. But there's uh, we have easy easy problem compared to some of these other countries, and we don't want to export our situation, but we at least we should seek to understand them, and we're going to have trouble with the. Islamic rule for a long time because of the invasion of Baghdad. I mean, that's just unthinkable for them. And that's going to be in the, in the, in the minds of, and souls of, of generations to come, that they seek to impose their culture on us. Thank you. Good evening, Father Dryan. And when I first uh, got the notification from the Cambridge Forum that you were going to be speaking on Can God and Caesar Coexist, I had some con conjured ideas about what you were going to discuss. And I guess what came into my mind is when I thought about... Oh, no, no, no. But, <laughs> but No, 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 no. But I guess what conjured up in my mind was George W. Bush as God and Caesar. And that that was... <laughs> Because this country has over the years, especially recently in this Republican second administration, more and more it seems to um, um, mirror the Roman Empire and some of the other empires throughout history in terms of religious persecution and conquering of other countries and repression. And... Um, okay. uh. We've always had a tendency to do this in the United States. Long before any of you were born, the country imposed prohibition uh, on the, a big, big mistake which was repealed f 15 years later. This was done by the Methodists and the Protestants, and they went throughout the country, and they had cities and politicians uh, wet or dry, and they changed the landscape. That was totally unacceptable. Are they trying to do that now? A little. And where do they get these ideas? Well, they say they get them from the Bible and they quote certain things that we, the righteous, should impose this on the non-righteous. But we like to think in America we uh, have a partnership. We say in Article 6 of the Constitution, no religious test shall ever be required for a public office. 
And we also say in the First Amendment, a nice balance. At the same time, we uh, like to think that we are a religious nation and that somehow our institutions presuppose the existence of a supreme being. That's what Justice Douglas said in 1952. So there's some deistic trend there that we want to respect religion and almost encourage people to do it. I don't say that we have the magic solution here. The Catholics certainly didn't fare very well. The aid was denied to them, and they had three million kids in the school, and they feel strongly about that. And we certainly didn't help the Mormons around 1900. We demand that they give up bigamy if Utah wants to be a state. So we've had a little ragged. That's why in the United States we should say to the world, we want to be your friend, we want to help you with these standards, and we will give you and share with you our ideals. And that would that work? Well, President Bush says we're going to export democracy. This is the power of democracy. And this is human rights. I wish you'd say that we want to join the world in helping you to guarantee internationally recognized human rights. That would be a better way to say you, you can impose or get democracy going there, and there's still going to be a, a persecution of religion. Yes. Father Joinen, it seems fairly obvious at first glance that we should have a covenant and we should have a court that would protect women's rights, particularly in the third world. But then much of the world could turn around and could ask us, what about your Mormons, your Orthodox Jews, your Roman Catholics? Shouldn't they permit women to be ordained? I guess the bottom line question is, as a lawyer or the former dean of our own law school at BC, how do you draw the line between what is specifically theological and what is purely political? That's, that's the, the key question. And in the United States, we say there shall be no establishment, but there shall be religious freedom. Well, on the, the status of women, that's under everything in the whole world. And that uh, the United States has not ratified, unfortunately, the covenant of the elimination of discrimination against women. And if that were, uh, we'd have some civilizing influence. However, that's one great difficulty with the Muslim religion, the status of women. And in a recent uh, dialogue with some of them, uh, all but one in that group of, say, 10 or 12 are Mormons, Oh, no, the women are, that's what the prophet says. And that we're not going to change because of the modern view. Well, is that just a cement wall? And uh, then they turned and said, well, the Catholic Church has some errors, too, with regard to women. And I said, yes, yes, I give up. But, uh, <laughs> no, so this, this, is the, this is the result of centuries when we hardly knew their existence and we never communicated. Now, everything is transformed, instantaneous, the globalization, and that we have more opportunity. And one simple thing is that we should have all types of thousands of people coming to our universities from these cultures, and also sending hundreds of people to Muslim countries and to China, I mean, into, into communication. And also, I think that the uh, religious leaders now are better theologians, and they don't say, oh, we're going to persecute these people or drive them out. And hopefully the number of religious leaders who would say that has gone down sharply. So ev everything has changed. Now, you say you buy the proposition I have in the book that we ought to make this a declaration, raise it from a declaration. Okay, but it, nothing is instantaneous. Symbolically, that would be fantastic. And the World Council of Churches, all of the churches, all of the Protestants, some of the would be for this, and they would help us. And the National Council of Churches here is in favor of this. They have 60 million mainline Protestants. So the sentiment is there. And uh, worldwide law. And that there's always going to be problems. How far can they go? And the gypsies in Europe have a very hard time. They, they migrate, and they're religious of a sort. Now, these problems, the religious freedom, intertwines with lots of other things, especially uh, the rights of women. But underneath this, the world document says, no government, no law should coerce religious leaders to change their position. And, and that's a guarantee, that that is sacred. And the Muslims... And others would say, this comes from God, and the prophet has revealed this. So we should be very careful to say, the government is not taking over. 
And you have uh, limits. You have a right to believe those things, even though some people think that you're intellectually wrong. And I think that religious leaders would, would agree to that. But some people move in, oh, we've got to change the law of women right away in Saudi Arabia. Well, it, it may come, but we need, and we need to understand them, too. They have lots of problems. They would say that a woman should dress modestly. <laughs> How are we going to interpret that? But at, at least we would start the dialogue. And this started about 100 years ago. There was a wonderful group that came to Chicago and put out a manifesto, and they updated that maybe eight years ago, and I have a chapter on that in the book. And uh, this is a very civilized way of doing it. But it come down basically that it's, it's one God and that we revere him in certain forms. We see the need to pray and to be united with God. And the Muslims do it five times a day to remind themselves. And there's a lot of theological and biblical bases. Can't we have some political solution? And up to now, it was, well, we're going to use the state to prosecute or persecute these people who are our enemies. And the Catholic Church indulged in that, and the Protestants maybe even more, and that uh, with the Crusades. And some Muslims in history have said that. We will wipe out the infidels. Well, we have the hope that that all God is that naive, maybe. And uh, will secular people, will, will they have armies and they want to wipe out the religious people? I haven't heard that. And unfortunately, in many areas of the world, the religious people themselves are fading away in their convictions and abandoning them. Thank you. Yes. How do you deal with people who confess uh, religious beliefs and yet who, who, who profess okay. religious beliefs and yet take away from the poor? People who are mullahs who uh, condone suicide bombings. These are people who can. <laughs> now, uh, now you're quite right, but you know, it's, it's a double standard. I, I I agree with you, and that that brings us into disrepute around the world. And when they say, "Well, you people are Christian," and uh, President Bush and lots of people. Uh, spend billions on, on armaments. And that, listen to this. The United States exports two-thirds of all the weapons used in the world, guns. And, and how can you justify that under anybody's religion? And likewise, the number of poor is growing in the United States. I have an article precisely on this in the National Catholic Reporter this week. And that we have a right to say that these people can't really pe pretend to be full Christians. Uh, we, we live in a country that sometimes you wonder is being uh, regularly de-Christianized. Well, it's, it's not a Christian nation, but that they're not following the basics of anybody's religion. Feed the poor and the hungry and, and help the refugee, all of those things. And we have a right and a duty to say that. And under my first point where we have to study we should disabuse people that this is a wonderful, glorious, God-fearing country. That ain't so. Yes. Uh, my name is <clears throat> Mary Tonaga. Uh, I was in Iraq in 1952, and at that time, all the higher education in the universities was in the hands of American Jesuits. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what I want to know when and who threw you out. <laughs> well, it was in, in 1969. It was the Ba'ath government, the predecessor of this group. And they threw out all Americans. It was the Protestant American University there. They were dispossessed. Well, the Jesuits and all the good guys have been trying for years to get back our property. There's 14 buildings there built by the Catholics of New England and of the country. And I don't know whether there's any hope of that. They're being used for other purposes. No, the Ba'ath government and they did some terrible things. But even if they do terrible things, the United States doesn't have the right to waltz in there without the authorization of the Security Council. One of the big revolutions in the history of the world 
was in 1945 when all of the nations said that we renounce the use of war except in extreme cases where the Security Council has, in fact, given permission. We wrote that. Roosevelt insisted upon it, and we've defied it. We thank you for your question, and uh, the Jesuits are trying now, but I'm not certain that it looks uh, good. The generation that did that has long passed away. Father Drynan, thank you for coming to talk. It was, it was also good seeing you on Meet the Press the other week. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was amazing to get... Uh, on Sunday? On Sunday? Even, Jew, even Jews don't work on Sunday. Um, it, it, was, it was good to see so many scholars of religion and, and other religious representatives uh, there uh, talking for a dialogue, and it was different than most uh, meet the presses. But I'm curious, as, as an academic and as a Jesuit, do we have, are we seeing in our society today, or has this been going on a while, that we have a sort of split between, you know, scholarship and intellectualism and, and religion? We, we seem to hear that in the Northeast we're very secular, uh, and people I know, even, you know, you speak glowingly of, of the real people from Muslim countries, and I work with them, and they're not very religious. It's easy not to be religious and it's easy to swear off religion completely. So That's what curious. the Holy Bible has always said. It's easier to fall away. But you ask a profound question, and it has, has no one clear answer. All I can say is that the universities in this country, some of them try to inculcate values. There's 232 Catholic colleges and universities in this country. 28 of them are Jesuits and that we continue not to indoctrinate, but to raise all of these profound questions. As far as I know, there's no Muslim university in this country. And many of the Protestant uh, places have faded away. The, West, the Methodists established 110 co colleges and universities in this country, including all the Wesleyans, and not a single one of them really has a core of Methodism or religion anymore. It's too bad. And that Brandeis and Cardozo have the problem, how Jewish shall we be? But that is it a secular country? The evangelicals say that, and they touch a truth, just what you indicated. And the evangelicals say, we have to re-Christianize this country. And it has a certain appeal to millions of people. But then they go push forward and say, well, we, you know, we want to be half, somewhat in control. And I've debated Reverend Farwell on many times on the tube, and he's not a, a, an educated man. He, he doesn't know about these things. He went to a Bible college. We have to get the Bible everywhere. I mean, that, that's kind of... However, I think we ought to keep insisting that the government should not push religion. That's inappropriate. And uh, this is an old, old debate. It surfaced in the presidential election of 1800, when they try to defeat Jefferson, saying he's not religious enough. So we should be very careful of intimating that, yeah, we need the government. Is the church so weak that they need the government? Ah, you oppose that to them. And that they wiggle a bit and they say, well, no, but the government has to be religious too. Well, there's a, a core there. This is a problem, and we have to continue with the tensions. But when we look at the world, that there's still wars over religion. We have to do something at the highest level. Now, some people say, like John Bolton, ah, what can the UN do? But the United Nations and the, the the Revolution for Human Rights has transformed the world. It brought about the collapse of uh, apartheid in South Africa. It, it is there. I mean, you can't discriminate on the basis of gender or race or sexual orientation. All of that is the new morality, if you will, of the world. We thank you. Yes, sir. I was following orders. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, this wasn't my main question, but there was a discussion of Iran a moment ago. Iraq? She's, Iraq? Sorry, I heard Iran. Then my, I, I'll go on to my question. Uh, which is, um, you talk a lot about Islam and the Muslim countries, but it seems to me that most of those countries have a kind of two-level 
relationship with the United States. The vast majority of those uh, governments are authoritarian. And for the most part, the dictators get along quite well with the U.S. government. That's what it seems to me, yeah. especially Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and others. They're very compliant with the wishes of the U.S. government. The people, on the other hand, I think are much more skeptical about, especially about the U.S. government, not so much about U.S. people, I, I don't think. What is, when, so when you talk about Islam and the Islamic countries, are you talking about the governments or the people, or does it make well, any difference? Uh, uh, both. The United States has cultivated certain states, and we put our weapons there, and we trade with them. And uh, we don't do much about the denial of religious freedom. We just try to get along. But no, I'm thinking about the less uh, less visible Islamic nations, tribe Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, others around the world. And that... Uh, Every nation is unique. We shouldn't say there's just 48 countries. And that we have not really uh, cultivated them as friends. They're, they're client states. And we have to dialogue and do more, exchange students, all types of stuff. They've been strangers to us, and they know that. And uh, they don't send their students here to college. They're afraid they'll be contaminated, I suppose. It's, it's a different culture. You know the famous book, The Clash of Civilizations, I don't know whether Sam Huntington is too extreme in that, but this is entirely new to us. After World War II, they were not in the loop, these countries. Then they got their independence from the colonial power, and then they want to have decency for their people. And we haven't done that much uh, to help them. We send the Peace Corps, that's a wonderful thing. If we quintuple the number of kids in the Peace Corps, that'd be a very good thing. And George Bush, the president, said that some time ago. We should increase that number. I don't think it has happened. Those are the ways by which we get their friendship. And that is very difficult for foreign students to get in now after 9-11. And the number has gone down. That's a shame. We should double, triple those things. That's the best investment we can make in that culture. So uh, if you and I were running the State Department, we'd do things different. And with all due... Without due respect to Dr. Rice, I haven't heard us say anything along this line. And we keep these weapons. And that the United States has adamantly refused to go into the International Criminal Court. This would be a permanent Nuremberg, a wonderful idea. And we're the, mo we're the only major nations that know we're not going to do that. And they say, well, we have these people all around the world. And that's a total misconstruction of what would happen. If we did join, all that would happen is that the international entity would report to the United States that this soldier of yours or civilian did terrible things, a violation. Nothing will happen for six months. If we turn up with a satisfactory result of a hearing, it all goes away. What's so terrible about that? We thank you. Thank you. I hope they see I got that all straight, did they? Uh, Father Brown, do you think we're living in a democracy or we, or we steadily be do you think we're living in a democracy or we're becoming steadily a secular oligarchy? Wow. I don't know. I, I think that these, the, uh, the Supreme Court has been quite good on church and state through the years. There's about 70 decisions beginning in 1947. And I think that we've, we've respected the, the practice of religion, especially the smaller sects like the Jehovah Witnesses. Are we losing some of our liberties? Well, we're certainly fighting over the Patriot Act, and that uh, we have lost some of our liberties, but uh, the courts protect us, and that's why some Republicans are so anti-federal courts now. That they have, uh, no, I, I think that as democracies go, uh, we're pretty, we, we get a B-plus, or even better. That would be, uh, be my assessment. However... We don't really have a voice in this country to denounce the fact that it's a militaristic nation. <sighs> Almost two million people under arms. And right out there in the Atlantic Ocean, we have 11 nuclear submarines with 250 nukes. Glory be to God, I mean. We, why don't we just renounce them? And the same thing in the Pacific. And that uh, we're still kind of shaken at torture in Abu Ghraib. I've written about it. How could this have happened? 
and the cruelty on strangers, foreigners in uh, Cuba, Guantanamo, our country did this. We're still stunned. That's why we need an international enemy to say you can't do these things, to enforce the, the rules of war. And the press tries. Sometimes we say, well, they don't scream enough, but, but they do for this information. And uh, Bush says, well, they, they elected me to a second term, and we have to be e even more vil vi vi vigilant now of what bad things might happen. And John Bolton will uh, do terrible things, and we won't even know it. He Just by silence, he does, he quells some of the good things in the UN and the international community. I, I mentioned, I think, that I was in Ukraine around Christmas time to be an observer of the election, and you cringe when these Europeans say, what's wrong with your country? And there was a lot of European parliamentarians there. Wow, it's... it's it's kind of embarrassing. How could this be happening? Losing our, some of our best friends. It, but it is. And uh, if we came on more forcefully on religious freedom, that would win a lot of people. And some people in Europe might aggressively say, keep out of our business, but they can't because this is international law. And if we had this commission or committee set up that would give us a vehicle, this would internationalize the scene, and that you could embarrass the Chinese or others simply by having hearings. And that's a technique that works sometimes. I was going to ask you how you stay, how you say stay so cool. In this. <laughs> how you stay so cool? Yes, you know, all these, you, you, I find on my t-shirt now, oh, it's just that the the rhetoric. I oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this might do it then. Now, my question is, uh, you know, last week we had this great outpouring of love for Pope John Paul II uh, and, and at the funeral, and you get an idea of just how many people just love this man around the world. But in some respects, I had a bad taste in, for the fact that he was also, in some respects, a very intolerant person as well, very intolerant in terms of how he, he ran the Catholic Church with an iron fist. Uh, and a good example would be Cardinal Law, how he still remains, <clears throat> you know, a very powerful person in, 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 in Rome. And I was just wondering, <clears throat> of course, they're going to be voting for a new pope, and what kind of man would you like to see uh, <clears throat> represented in the Roman Catholic Church who might help <clears throat> continue to foster the love and peace that Pope John Paul II you know, try to foster around the world, but also bring a little more, I think, independence and democracy to the Roman uh, Catholic Church as well. We're all trying to analyze that in the last week. And uh, he, there's a lot of mythology about him, as a, about Reagan, that they stopped communism. Well, they stopped for a wide variety of reasons. But that he's a uh, man with great faith and love, and it's left to the future to assess his policies. Could he have done more? Now, there's many Catholics who disagree fundamentally with his positions on women and some other things. And, uh, I don't know how it's going to unfold. But at least uh, the whole world said, here's a man that was strict and stern, a, a believer, and he died after 26 years of service. And at the moment, the world is saying, well, that's a good example. History will have to judge what could he have done more. And that the government, however, or even in the national law, is not going to say to the Catholic Church, you have to ordain women. There's, there's a barrier. They have a right to believe what they believe. And uh, the government should not co coerce them. In if there's illegal or immoral activity condoned by religion, well, that, that's something different. Uh, all I can say is that the Catholic Church is a vast institution, well over a billion people. I have an op-ed in tomorrow's newspaper, the USA Today, uh, suggesting that a non-European pope would be a good thing. We've never had a, a non-European, but 2,000 years. And I tell a little story that I was in South Africa just after the collapse of apartheid, and I was talking to some students, and one night there was a group of black students there, and one man got up and, and spoke. His name was Seth very commanding presence. 
And he said, I have rejected everything that the Europeans brought to this country, including Christianity. Yay. Well, I try to say Christianity is different. I wasn't making it. But uh, lots of people around the world think of Christian, Christianity as European. And they have all their grievances with these colonial powers. So if we had a non-European for the first time in 2,000 years, yeah, they'd have to think a little different. I'm, I'm not certain that I have the votes to get a non-European. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Right away. All right, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. I was concerned with George Bush when he says we have enemy combatants. How can we not have the Geneva Convention as a, just a common way of treating everybody decently? How is it possible that we've come to that as a country? Uh, just keep saying that and writing that, and my name is on two or three briefs in the Supreme Court about that very thing, and we've made an initial victory, but the courts have said exactly that, that you have to give them the minimum due process things required by the four Geneva Conventions. They relate to the conduct of war. The Congress of the United States adopted them in total in 1948. It's a part of our law, and it's right there in the manual of conduct for, for the soldiers. And I don't know how he's getting away with this. And he said, well, this is different. They're terrorists at all. And I feel certain that the 500 poor prisoners at Guantanamo are going to sue the United States. And they'll be like the Japanese who were interned. I was on that presidential commission, and we gave indemnification for all of the survivors, $20,000 a person plus an apology. And that cost uh, the government $1.4 billion. Even Reagan signed it. And there's going to be something like this. Now, the five Brits from Guantanamo who were sent back, they're already preparing to sue in a federal court in the United States. And I'll be on the brief. They should win. <laughs> we, have, we have certainty about some things tonight. <laughs> Thank God we have some. Uh, yes, sir. Have you ever thought about running for a political office again? <laughs> this, is the, this is the best bon mot of the night. I uh, saw Bonnie Frank the other day at the Capitol at this event. And uh, Bonnie Frank says, if the new pope allows priests to be in Congress, I'll give my seat back to Dryden. <laughs> you are... You are you are a wonderful audience, and I thank, I thank Father Massaro and our nice uh, lady uh, of ceremonies and the Cambridge Forum. And it was established long ago, probably by Emerson or, or somebody, <laughs> and that it keeps the, keeps the dialogue alive. And tonight I've introduced something that I hope uh, this is a little much. I hope it transforms your lives. And that if we understood this, what's going on around the world, all those people in faraway countries will say there's some people there who uh, understand this and how our problems are. And these people, some people in the Islamic world think that we're very lax and we're not very religious. And they often note the fact that there's a 100 million people in America with no church affiliation and that they look upon us as a cruel country very arrogant and uh, dominating. And it may be that if there's a significant number of people, religious and non-religious, who are sensitized to their problems through the century, that's the way that we get some international understanding. And you may say, well, it's, it's too good to be true, but it's not. And that around the world there's an anti-war movement. Uh, the Quakers, the Catholics are practically pacifists now after the last pope. And that People know that, and people have have, uh, have have affection for us if we stand up for them. If you want to say, well, does all of this ever amount to anything? The death penalty is about to be abolished. And the court, now the Supreme Court says you can't to, to do it to juveniles or people who are mentally retarded, and the whole world has given it up. And why? Well, I like to take some credit that the Catholic bishops are adamantly against the death penalty, now reversing Catholic teaching for a long time. And the Polish Pope said that, too. Well, uh, the moral voice doesn't always carry 
but it, it, it symbolizes lots of things. And that if all of us, uh, even if we don't technically believe in Revelation and the, and the Bible, if we say that at least I love people, this is so self-evident, and the Unitarians feel it more than other people sometimes, that he's a human being. God created him, or somebody created him, and he's entitled to sanctity, to veneration, to respect, and that's what international law has done. And after World War II, we were so stunned with the Holocaust, we said, let's have a code of ethics, a bill of uh, human rights all around the world, and that's what we did. And our country led it. And Mrs. Roosevelt was adamant that we need the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And FDR was gone, but Truman carried this on. And I read just the other day about the formation of the United Nations in San Francisco under President Truman in 1948. There were 48 nations there, and we took the leadership. Why have we lost the leadership? And it's just so sad that John Bolton has never heard of this. Somehow he has a different world mind that we. He said openly, he said that we would use the United Nations if it's good for the purposes of the United States. Listen, I, I thank the forum, and I hope I can come back soon and often.